Hey guys, welcome. My name is Arthur and today I would like to tell you something about the metadata URIs inside ERC-1155 smart contracts. If you don't know what it is, the ERC-1155, how to deploy it, how to uh, deploy your smart contract and use it on the OpenSea, I highly recommend you to watch some of my previous videos when I cover that in details. However, in this video, I will be focused on only on the metadata because I think there are some things uh, on the ERC-1155 that might be confusing and I already received many questions about how to make the metadata URI immutable, how to update it, how to make it um, supported on the OpenSea. So I will cover all these um, topics in this uh, single uh, video. Uh, before I jump in into the subject of this video, I would like to invite you to my Discord channel and to attend in my free Web3 email course. You can find the link in the description and you can join anytime. So um, I will start with uh, explaining to you how ERC-1155 uh, holds metadata URI by default. Then I will show you how to tweak it so OpenSea supports it because uh, OpenSea is the most popular marketplace for NFTs. However, it doesn't support uh, the default implementation of the ERC-1155. So we have to tweak it a bit so the OpenSea supports it. Uh, then I will touch a bit uh, decentralized storages and how to make your metadata inside your smart contracts immutable. Uh, then I will also show you very easy technique um, about storing the unique URI per each token. I think this is quite useful if you you have your collection and you are minting uh, more tokens to the collection over time and for instance it's not possible for you to mint all the tokens up front uh, and still you want to for instance use IPFS then you have to tweak your smart contract implementation a bit so you can store a dedicated URI per each uh, token and on the last step I will show you how you can control access to the metadata and how you can basically uh, change the implementation so owners of the smart contract can actually update the metadata. A look inside the code, here is the regular ERC-1155. Here I'm just passing the long uh, string that is the URI unified per each token that would be deployed inside this smart contract. So this is uh, the default uh, implementation. So we have the constructor, here we have the URI, and this URI is the same for each token. So now I will deploy this smart contract so you can take a look how this works in reality. And here you can see that even if I type the token ID 1, then the function returns me unified substring and um, any client can replace um, this substring ID with the real ID of the Charizard or the Ivysaur. And you may ask yourself, okay, why it's implemented that way? Why it doesn't return um, the ready URI for the token ID 0, 1 or 2 or 3? And the reason for that is that every code that you write inside the smart contract, every variable, every function that you may use, it costs you gas. For instance, if I would like to deploy this smart contract now, if I will just save it and try to deploy it to mainnet, by the way, if you are interested in how much deploying of the smart contract really costs, uh, the easiest way to do it is just uh, set up your MetaMask to use uh, mainnet and then just use the injected Web3 environment and just try to deploy. Of course, you don't have to confirm the transaction and it costs uh, right now approximately $470. So that's quite a lot on the mainnet. However, if I would uh, right now um, add the overwritten um, URI function, which takes the token ID and returns um, the string with um, the token uh, ID without this technique that client have to replace the substring. And if I would click um, right now on the deploy, we should see uh, that this contract is taking a bit more of gas. Um, so as you can see here, we have six instead of five. And if we click on the confirm right now, you would see um, that we have more 
just for um, this uh, function. So, of course, for some people and some situation it doesn't make any difference. However, uh, if you have to deploy a lot of contracts like that, then uh, even small improvements like this one with the substring um, are meaningful. However, you don't have any choice uh, at the moment and you have to override the URI function if you want this smart contract to be compatible with um, the OpenSea. Without that, my uh, metadata file were not working. So right now I will go to the JavaScript virtual machine again because I don't want to spend my real ether and you actually saw that I had insufficient funds. Um, so if I would click right now on the URI function and just specify here the two and run the function, you can see that right now we are returning the correct URI. Um, so this should work on the open C. So uh, you know the reasons why the original ERC 1155 has the substring and you know how to change it so it works on the open C. Now I will tell you a few words about um, how to make the metadata immutable. Because, of course, uh, if we are hosting our metadata in the centralized storage, then we are, uh, it's possible to change our data or to shut down the server. However, if we store our files on the decentralized storage, uh, then it works differently. So if I type in here 0.json, um, you can actually see that this file is hosted on the IPFS. So if I navigate to the IPFS URL, you can see that here I have the meta file um, that is stored in the decentralized manner. So it's not possible for me to change the content of this file. And this file is independently stored in the network. So it is impossible for me uh, to mess with the data. And I think this is quite important if you have the NFTs and you want to leave them in the web forever. Uh, if you want to um, upload your whole collection of um, the graphics or metadata um, for your NFT collection, uh, you may uh, want to use the NFT storage service, which is super great and it's very easy to use. You can um, just hit the upload and the upload uh, works like any other um, uh, upload in the internet. So we can just upload any file and it will go to the IPFS through the NFT storage application, which simplifies the dealing with the IPFS. It's also possible for you um, to have your API keys and basically use their SDK for uploading these files. Um, so uploading one file is easy. However, if you have more um, files and you have collection of, for instance, 10K NFTs and you want them to live under um, the same URL, so we have the directory, so for instance, the whole directory and here we have 0, 1, 2, and 3, etc. Uh, then it's very easy to do. You can go to this IPFS content address archive and this works in the way that you can select here multiple files and if you choose these files and you can click open, then you have the special car, car file that you can store uh, on your directory and here you can use it um, on the NFT storage and just go to the files and have the upload. And here you can just uh, upload the very same file and if you click the upload, then all these files will go to the IPFS. Right now, um, there's no new file for me because um, IPFS is smart and they uh, detected that I already uploaded the very same directory with the very same content. So they generated for me the same uh, checksum. So it's already uploaded. And then you have this special link that you can use and you can have your whole collection of your uh, metadata files on the IPFS. 
Of course, this is only possible if you uh, know your collection up front, because then uh, you cannot use this technique for adding more um, tokens, because then if you add a new metadata file, it will go to the ver to the completely different URI. So this uh, gas uh, efficient technique will not work. Um, this um, function will also not work because we have the same uh, base URL for the whole collection. However, we can right now um, tweak it a bit and I will show you how you can um, use that and how you can have the unique URI per each token. So right now I will show you again that we can overwrite um, the token I, uh, the, the URI function. However, this will work a bit different and we can store um, the dedicated URI per each token. So in order to do it, I will prepare the private uh, variable, which would be mapping. So mapping is a special structure that I can map the token ID into the string. And then we're gonna need the function which can be publicly uh, called. And of course, we are overriding uh, the typical URI function, which is uh, by default in ERC 1155. And this function, all it does, it accesses the URIs and just return the URI that we have for the specific token. So this is the public view that returns the string from the memory of our smart contract. However, this function is not enough because we need to find a way to also specify the token um, URI once we mint um, our token. So in order to do that, we're going to need also the set token URI function, which takes two parameters. One is token ID and the second one is actually the URI of our token. And here we are just assigning it to our mapping. So this should be uh, enough. However, this implementation is not perfect because first of all, you can see that the set token URI can be publicly called by anyone. And this is actually not a good situation because if I change the wallet, let's say I will go with another address, which is not a deployer of this smart contract, I still can change uh, the URIs. So if I will transact again, and if I would go to the URI token ID, uh, you can see that it points to the NFT storage. So somebody can really mess up with this data. And here, if you go, you can see that somebody can completely remove the URI um, just by calling this public uh, function. So anybody can do it. And um, I think we can fix that in a very easy way and we can use the ownable functionality. So if you don't, if you are not familiar with the ownable, this is a special util that um, can be uh, that you can extend your smart contract. And actually, it's also needed if you would like to manage your collection on the um, OpenSea. So you have the ownable smart contract. And this works uh, in the way that whenever you um, deploy the smart contract, then um, it um, assigns uh, the deployer as an initial owner of uh, the smart contract. So for instance, if we would call the owner, you can see that we have here the address of um, that I use for deploying that smart contract, because we can use the modifier and the modifier is a special um, type of function that is called before running um, your real function. So for instance, we can use the modifier only owner and uh, this modifier will check whether the caller is the owner of the smart contract. And if the caller is the owner, then the rest of the function would be executed. Otherwise, it would be thrown an error. So here we can use uh, just next to the public only owner modifier. And right now, if I would deploy the smart contract again, let's try to change um, the URI. So set token ID zero. Here uh, we have this URI and it should work because we are the owners. However, if I would change um, 
yeah, because I, I deployed it with this um, uh, address. If I would change address and would try to set token URI again, then you can see that we have um, the revert. So the reason provided by the contract is caller is not the owner. And one last step that I would like to show you, because we talked a bit about immutable and we talk about the IPFS and uh, controlling our metadata. Uh, one last thing uh, we can do here um, is preventing setting token URI twice. So for instance, if we mint the Charizard and we specify the metadata for the Charizard, maybe we want to do it just once after the minting and we shouldn't allow that even to the owner. So uh, in order to do that, all we have to do is use require in which we are checking uh, that the URI's token is empty. And inside um, the Solidity, uh, the very easy way to check whether the string is empty is actually cast the string into the bytes. And you can do it just by wrapping the string into the bytes and checking that the length of it is equal to zero. And if it's not zero, um, then this uh, requirement would be false. And then you would get the revert function and the rest of this code would be not called. So we have the require that is checking that actually um, the URI cannot be set um, twice. So let's deploy it again. And let's see if we would get the immutable effect of our metadata URIs. So I will deploy as the first guy here, hit the deploy. And here, if we go to the set token URI, and we would specify the zero, and maybe um, some random address here, and go zero, then you'd see that we have the URI, but let's do it again. And you can see that we cannot set the URI twice. So you can see that we have more functions. We have the URI, we have the set token URI that can be called only by the owner. And we can set um, the address for this URI that can be completely different than this base IPFS URI. And I think this is quite powerful combination because we can set the metadata once and we can also combine it with the IPFS or some other solutions like StoreJ or Filecoin or Arweave. You can check these solutions. They are also allowing you to store your data permanently in the decentralized network. So today you learned about how to store uh, metadata information on ERC-1155. You know why this um, standard approach is not working on the OpenSea. You know what to do if you want to support this on the OpenSea. Plus, you know how to react to setting the token URI just once and how to set it dynamically after the minting. And that's it. That's all for today. I hope you like this video and learned something new. If you have some questions, just leave them in the comment section down below. Uh, feel free to click on the like button and see you next time on this channel.